way to do it and said, wouldn't you agree that a good safety rule is to check your brakes on all four axles before you leave the terminal, right? Now we're just hammering on them, right? As opposed to asking them a rhetorical question. What should you do with your brakes of your, your truck before you leave the terminal? Let them tell us. And then we get to say, pick out anything you want and say, is that important? Why is that important? Would you expect any careful truck driver to do the same thing? How long have truck drivers been doing that thing? Would it be wrong just to ignore that? Would it be reckless to ignore it? That all comes out of a rhetorical question with their words. So their words always have more value to us when it comes to a jury listening to them. Because if you beat up on the witness, they're going to feel sorry for the witness. We don't want them to feel sorry for the witness. We want this to come out of their words and their mouths without us beating up or bullying them into an answer. The rhetorical question is the other thing, is when you say, wouldn't you agree that a good safety rule, you can draw an objection, and I have to say, we're all lawyers. We're people of words. So there are, in fact, in our, our book, Advanced Deposition Strategy and Practice, I think we list 20 synonyms for rule. So you don't have to use the rule, word rule, but another technique to get around that is to use rhetorical questions. Now, rhetorical questions, this is actually a study on the use of rhetorical questions in litigation. The fact of the matter is, they are a very effective way to communicate with juries. Because when you ask a rhetorical question, they hear the question, and they answer it in their head. Not always, most of the time, they're going to, these questions they're gonna answer in their head. And if the witness gives any other answer, that witness has no credibility with that jury anymore, which is why drafting the question is so important. We're gonna ask a question where every juror answers the question in their head exactly the way we want them to. And you can test that. But anyway, rhetorical questions, very effective way to persuade. So well, how do you do rhetorical? Begin the question with who, what, where, why, how, maybe? Because I'm trying to get you away from cross-examining someone. So it's gotta be an open-ended question, a rhetorical question, it's not a yes, no, right? And you can test it with non-lawyers in office. It's like, and begin with who, what, where, why, how, because that's going to lead you into an open-ended question that then, if it's framed correctly, there's only one answer to that question or a series of answers, all of which are good to you. I'm going to give you some examples right now. Don't suggest an answer. It's not a yes, no. Fewer words is better. You have to repeat it like a mantra, potentially, right? No technical or legal words. So some of us, are subject matter experts. Trucking, nursing home, medical malpractice, long list of things that we are subject matter experts in. And the answer is the people in the box don't know those words or those terms. So non-technical, non-legal words. Here's a rhetorical. Have all of you answered it in your head? All right, let me get. What was your answer, sir? Hydrate. Hydrate. Yours? Give him food and water. What about you? What's your answer? All right, all right. Anybody else? What do you think? Alert somebody else. All right, so all of those, you know, of course, you know what happened in this case. Nothing happened in this case. <laughs> They realize the patient's not getting, by the way, this is Satch's case, I believe, not getting hydration or nourishment, they don't do anything. So, what's, so when you ask that question to the corporate rep, they're gonna say something like any of these answers, and as soon as they give us that answer, they've established the rule themselves. And what do we do? That's it, those are the questions. We just ask the rhetorical question. By the way, the way you, you, you would, just walking into a deposition without ever asking anyone else in the world this question is probably a mistake. But if you ask two or three people, if you actually do a focus group and you ask the question, and you're consistently, I mean, whatever answers the focus group gave me, I'd use those. Because it's not a lawyer answer. But otherwise, just ask some people. Now you know what to expect, and when you ask the question, if it's anything way off of that, that's probably not bad for you. But ultimately, you want to take that answer, turn it into a rule, and say, is that important? They just answered, they just given you the answer to, to what, you know, to that question. What should you do? You say, is that important? What are they going to say? They have to say yes. 
You say, why is that important? Now, they don't think that they've never thought about answering the question why before. So they're going to give you something. It's almost always good. If it's not good enough, you say, what else? Tell me more. They may give you three or four things. Would it be wrong for a CNA to ignore a patient and do nothing who has problems with hydration and nourishment? Would it be wrong just to do nothing? What are they going to say? They've just given you the rules. They said it's important. They're going to say yes. And then you can say, would it be reckless? Objection. You can go ahead and answer. The answer is, I don't really care whether the answer or not, because about 30% of the time you'll get it. But it sounds kind of reckless, doesn't it? So it's really simple. But don't try to make up your own words. Just do those four things. Just do those four things for a while to get the hang of it. It'll work every time. You know, if it doesn't work, it's because you had a crappy question to begin with. Uh, which is why you should test the question a little bit. So here's another one. Everybody got the answer in their head? You're a juror now. You got the answer in your head? I'm going to come back. This looks like an intelligent juror. How would you answer this question, sir? Very. Very vigilant. <laughs> Very vigilant. Now, you know, the answer is, I have to say on this question, there's not a lot of variation in the answer to that question. So you say, say is that important? Why is that important? Well, would it be, here we go, be wrong just to ignore that principle? Would it be reckless to not be vigilant when you're operating on someone's spine? So that's, that's cha-ching. Again, we're not suing for punitive damages. We're characterizing the conduct in a way that is intentional. Right? Punitive damages are just, that's, that's a, it's just a swamp and a quagmire for us as plaintiff's lawyers, basically. All right, here's another one. Open-ended, it's a rhetorical question. Pretty simple, right? I haven't been down to this end. I'm, I'm going to pick on you since you're at the end. It's easy to get to. All right. So what should answer this question? Why should a manu what should a manufacturer do when they begin, begin getting reports of product failures? Investigate the, Investigate the failures. Good, good, good. All right, I'm going back. Dorsey? Yes, sir. What should a manufacturer do when they begin getting reports of product failures? Recall? We got report? We got recall? Read your name, this is terrible. Taylor, what about you? All right, notice to consumers. So I like all three of those answers. Now, if we're really serious about this, we might test it with some consumers, see what kind of answers they come up, and try to get something that's inclusive. But what should a manufacturer do when they begin getting reports of product failures? You know, any of those answers are good for us. So we're taking a 30B6 deposition of a corporate rep and we ask them that question. If they don't give us something that's in the range of what any normal person would say, then we say, what else? Because we know what the rule should be. We're not going to stop because he said he didn't give us what he He said, okay, what else? We're going to say what else until he gives us something that we can use that relates to the issues in the case like reporting it, recalling it, or telling people. So they don't give it to, what, what else? Tell me more. After they've done that, after we've got that out of their mouth, extracted it from their soul, that they ought to do something, then we say, is that important? So you can say, is giving, sending a notice to consumers important? Came out of their mouth, they're gonna say yes. Why is it important? Would it be wrong not to notify consumers when you have a product that's got repeated failures? Uh, mm, uh, maybe you don't care, right? But you can still ask the reckless question. Would it be reckless if you had a product that had repeated failures and never, ever, 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 ever tell consumers about it? Well, blah, 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 you know. So those are examples of rhetorical questions, open-ended questions 
that establish a principle or rule in your case that's going to help you win or get the case settled. And you start off with the open-ended question. Let them answer it. Of course, it's got to be a question that they give you an answer that you can use or you're willing to go back in on and say, what else? Tell me more. So, for example, you might, they give me, they give, well, why is it important to check the brakes on the truck? Well, where are the tires? Right? Well, where are the tires doesn't mean. You say, well, what else? Until they get to the point to make sure the tires are safe. It's because you have to go after them until you get what you want. And then you say, is checking the tires to make sure they're safe, is that important? Yeah? Why is it important? Why else? Would it be wrong for someone not to check the tires on the tire? Okay. Would it be reckless? So that's, that's the progression. Uh, now this is Satch's. This is the Yo Mama approach. Now Satch is from, you know, you know Satch, Satch is from Arkansas. He's the only person I've ever known that went to college on a rodeo scholarship. He still participates in team roping. He trains horses and his daughters. They're always well behaved, isn't that right? Yes, except when he's around, at least when he's around anyway. So this is Satch's, and you used this, I think you used this on a stand, didn't you? Yes. So remember the golden rule, you know, you can't ask plaintiffs, put, the jurors to put themselves in the shoes of a plaintiff. That's the golden rule, everybody know that? That's a no-no, can't do it. This is the defendant. This is the defendant doctor. This is executed, Satch, only Satch could execute it probably, but if your mom was, lying right here and right now and she was not receiving enough hydration to sustain life. Would you want someone to call your mama's doctor? Yeah. Now you could say, is that important? Yeah. Why is that important? Because she could die otherwise. Would it be wrong just to ignore that and not call the doctor? Do you care what he says at this point? Would it be reckless? Do you care what he says at this point? You're in the trap. So it's remarkably simple, but it's all about the rule or the rhetorical question, the thing you're starting to prove. Everything after that is just a catechism. I think that's, I'm not Catholic, but I think that's the right use of the word anyway. Uh, okay. Think strategically about the use. When and who do you ask? I said earlier, this has got to be binding testimony. You don't want to blow this on some underling at some company. I want binding testimony because this is something that's going to help me win this case. And what's the setup? Do you have to, for, you want to put the set up in, in legal terms? Are there foundational elements that you need to establish before you ask this question? And maybe in a 30B6 deposition, it would be the notice of deposition itself and the areas of inquiry. And so before you went to the mousetrap, you'd make sure that this person is presented here to talk about tire safety, for example, or best nursing practice, practices with, with uh, with um, frail patients, whatever it is. Whatever, it's gotta be in that, covered by that notice of deposition, now you've got binding testimony. Do you believe Star Transport has a duty to operate its truck safely? Yes. Is that important? Yes. Why is that important? For the well-being of the driver itself and the well-being of the public. Okay. Okay, um, this was a, it was a trucking death case and contested liability, and there was another lawyer on it who'd been a defense lawyer for 40 years at the time, and when I finished the examination, he didn't ask a single question. And he told me, there's no point in messing up a good examination. So this is the first time we used the mousetrap, 2004. This is 18 years later, right? Does it still work? All the time. You gotta pick the right question. Right? So this is, this is my first time, and you know, it made that case, that case settled. It was, I was happy that it settled. It settled for great money at the time. And then I've used it ever since. And Tom Vesper saw this video clip at the Advanced Deposition College and called it the Miller Mousetrap. And so that's how it got stand. Do you believe Star Transport has a duty to prevent access? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you think Star Transport has a duty to stop unsafe driving practices? Yes. Okay. Is that important? Yes. Why is that an important duty for Star Transport? Because I don't think myself or you or anybody in this room would want one of our, an unsafe driver behind the wheel of one of our trucks when we're riding next to him on the interstate. So the backstory is this particular driver had had 
four speeding violations in the three years prior to hire. Okay, and, his, and, his, and we were able to establish that he was routinely exceeding the speed limit on his routes and wasn't logging anything. It was, it was just, we had lots of stuff to say this is a bad driver. But that's, that's the setup, and then we get to show what the actual facts are. So if you know what the facts are, you can set up some things that make the people look inconsistent or fraudulent or liars. But you have to know some what, what, what the facts are. Mr. Randolph, as the corporate representative for Long, do you believe that Long has a duty to operate its trucks safely? Yes. That's important. Of course. And why is it important? Just how we operate. You've got to operate safely to, to consider the motoring public, to keep people safe around you. Do you believe Long Foundation has a duty to encourage drivers to make safety a priority? Yes. Every day? Every day. Okay. So 10 years later, I'm doing it. It's, 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 it just keeps working. It's working today. But uh, this, is a, this happens to be a death, death case. Uh, this is an exhibit I had this man say. So part of controlling a witness, and one of the things you do when you have people in a mousetrap, is you can establish an exhibit that you can use at trial. You can provide it to your experts. In some cases, you can use it in opening statement. You can probably use it in closing argument. You can use it in cross. This is signed by the corporate rep. The issue in this case is they had a tractor trailer that was attempting U-turn on a public roadway and turned right in front of a guy on a motorcycle and killed him. So I'm happy with that rule. But you can do more. But creating an exhibit to control the client as well as nail down what the rule is, the principle is that you're trying the jury, making sure that the jury understands. So this is insist on an answer, and this is my good friend, now deceased, Paul Scopter, who had a nursing home case. A nursing home case involved a transfer of an elderly woman and for, from her bed to a chair, and for some reason, they blew the transfer, dropped her, and she broke both hips. They denied liability. So Paul's taking the deposition. He's taking the deposition by telephone. Now, if you haven't done that or you have an opportunity or you're forced to do that, do not cry. I know everything now would be done by Zoom. When you take a deposition by telephone, they forget that you're there. They'll make all kinds of expressions, do all kinds of stuff they would never do on Zoom because they can see themselves on Zoom. This is a telephone, telephone deposition. Paul is in his office in Milwaukee. He's got his feet up on his desk because he always has his feet on the desk. He's got the file spread out in front of him. He hasn't had to travel two miles. He's taking the deposition of this woman who's the head of nursing at this particular nursing home. And the simple principle he is trying to nail down is this was not a safe transfer. I mean, if you drop a woman and break both of her hips, that's not a safe transfer. But she didn't want to say that. So this is the other part of the mousetrap or any other kind of deposition. When you know something's the truth, you insist on an answer. I, they can be evasive. You stay with them. I, I had an example. <laughs> Sash had a, a doctor in a medical malpractice case. He had some rules. It took him, how long did it take you to get that guy to admit the rules? Like an hour? So he's on one rule, essentially, for an hour with his doctor and then until the doctor finally gave it to him because it was the truth. And Sash wasn't going to leave without the truth, and none of you need to leave without the truth either. Here's, a great Here's what I think is a great example. Limit each question to one fact. This is a cross technique, right? Make each question short, a mantra you can repeat over and over again. And then if the witness runs, repeat the question. The jury heard the question once. Now they've heard it twice. They know what the answer is to the question. They know the witness is being evasive. You've already won this examination. But you're not done because they haven't admitted the truth yet. Let's see if I can get this to play. If I do this, it's going to play? Nope. Could you hit play on that PowerPoint slide, please? No, you have to go to the, you have to actually go to the image. There we go. No. Click on the image in the bottom left, there'll be a, see that arrow there? There you go. Sure, let me ask a different way. She was at high risk regardless of what type of transfer was going on, wasn't she? Yes, but she could safely be transferred with one person and the easy stand. That's not true on April 4th, was it? I'm sorry, I do not understand what you're trying to say. 
Well, you said she could be safely transferred with one person in an easy stand, but on April 4th, there was one person at an easy stand and she wasn't safely transferred, was she? Answer the question. Go ahead. If you if you don't have an answer to the question, then tell Attorney Scott to that. I cannot answer that question. Why? Because I was not present at the time. Well, you know what happened, right? She slid off the bed and, and broke both her hips, didn't she? I'm just going to inter interject with an objection. Um, as the witness has testified, she knows what happened. In, happened in some respects based on a conversation she had as she stated she was not in the room so may not know all of the circumstances surrounding the incident and that may or may not contribute to um, her response to this particular question okay but you can let her say that you don't have to Sorry. speak for her Carly okay <laughs> um, you understand that she split off the bed right that was what was reported and she broke both of her hips, right? That was what was reported. Do you consider that to be a safe transfer? <laughs> I'm gonna object to the form of the question. <laughs> you can answer, ma'am. I cannot answer that specifically the way you're stating it because I was not? not present. Well, based on what you know, was that a safe transfer or not? If she, no, it was not. One of the jobs of a CNA in your facility in 2002 was to provide for safe transfers, correct? Correct. That's also true of your, LP, of your LPNs? Correct. And also true of your RNs, right? Correct. This LPN, what was her, uh, strike that, this uh, CNA, what was her name? Mary, you know? Mary Mossy. Mary. Um, you would agree with me that Mary did not provide a safe transfer for Ms. Kozabud based on what you know about what happened, right? I'm going to object to the form again. You can go ahead sure. and answer. No, she did not. And in fact, she provided an unsafe transfer, didn't she? Object to the form. I just answered that question, didn't I? Well, I said I said it a little bit differently this way. It was unsafe, wasn't it? Object to the form. You can go ahead and answer. Yes. And providing an unsafe transfer for a resident is below the standard of care, correct? Object to the form of the question. Yes. Okay, so I took Paul seven minutes. You know, the first answer, most people would have walked away after the first answer, right? Because she's just not going to give it to us. But the truth was obvious. It wasn't a safe transfer if you drop a woman who's an invalid, you know, while using an assisted device and she breaks both hips. That cannot be called a safe transfer by anyone. And so he just stayed with it till they got her. Simple as that. I say it's simple as that, huh? So this is another case. This is a tractor trailer turning. Uh, this is an uncontrolled cut in a four-lane highway. The speed is 55 miles an hour. A guy on a motorcycle is coming behind. The tractor trailer turns in front of him. The guy on the motorcycle has got nowhere to go. 
he gets killed. So what do they do? They blame the motorcycle driver. Right? It's a, it's a no-offer case. Motorcycle drivers are per se reckless. He was going too fast. He wasn't paying attention. Yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. So um, we had to take a couple of depositions. Um, if unsafe practices result in the loss of property or life, should the company learn from those mistakes and make some change? Yes. Would it be reckless for a company to experience a loss of property or life and make no changes at all? Objection. Yes. Form foundation. Right. Would it be reckless for them to operate without making safety a priority? Yes. Objection. Okay. So this is not a case of punitive damages. I just want to use the word reckless. I want him to use the word reckless. I want it to be more than just negligence. There's an intentionality associated with this. So that's why I'm saying reckless. They can object. I can use it's my deposition. I can use any word I want. Right? They can't really instruct the witness not to answer. So um, that was that's the, this is that happens to be a corporate representative. You saw the diagram with the wreck. This is the exhibit that I had him sign in the deposition. Now, I, I think Satch and I have been using these agree disagree boards for a decade now. Uh, and there's a whole variety of using but I, I actually hand it to him in the deposition. Will you read this, please? And they read it into the record. Would you agree with that? Is that true? Would you please check the box? Oh, by the way, you have to have a Sharpie. So they use a ballpoint, it's not going to show up very well. You give them a Sharpie, have them check the box, and then sign it. If there's an objection, they won't sign it. I sign it for them. I said, Mr. Smith, I don't want you to get in trouble with your lawyer. He doesn't want you to sign it. Between you and me, this is a true statement. There's no question about that. I'm going to go ahead and put your initials and my initials down here because we know it's a true statement. Exhibit number three. Move on. Well, they won't let him sign it. You know, that's about here all the time. I don't care if they let him sign it or not. It's going in. So uh, this is the CEO. As so long as this is, it says safety policy up at the top. Can you read what follows that? Take the time to be safe. Yes. Would you like me to read the entire? Please. Any collision between one of our tractor trailers and most other vehicles can potentially cause serious injury or death to the driver or passengers of the other vehicle. As an employee of Long Foundation, we want and expect you to take the time to be safe. Is that a good safety rule? I believe it to be. Would you adopt that as the president of your business? I believe so. Would you mind signing it right there, please? Let me ask you a question what, here. What, um, is this a document that you've created where you've actually put the name of the company up there? Is, is of course. It, yeah. This isn't a document that came from, from our safety, safety policy. No, no, no. This is a document that's created. Have, why would it have our letterhead on it? Yeah, let me object to, to, the, to enter, entering into any kind of manufactured document in which you present it to the jury as being a long foundation drilling company document right. by actually putting their logo and letterhead on there. Well, well, checking to this in if, if, if Mr. Long agrees to it, it is, and if he doesn't agree to it, it is. So the question is, Long, is that's, you said that's a good safety rule. I think that's a Do you think it's reasonable. reasonable to adopt that as a rule for your company? I think it's a reasonable expectation. Do you, can you think of any reason why you wouldn't sign that and make a safety rule of your, of your company right now? Not necessarily. Okay. Would you go ahead and sign that, please? He, he was, consternation would be the expression on his face, I think. So this is, the, this is the document he signed. He's the president. That's the language. You know, where did I get the letter? It was produced in discovery. So I just pasted it into a Word document. I made that rule up. I wasn't looking at the Federal, code of Ameri Federal Motor Carrier Safety Code. It was just common sense. Take the time to be safe. This guy was in a hurry. He couldn't wait for the motorcycle coming up on his flank. He just turned right in front of him. You should take the time to be safe. So he signs, I'm going, great. But I had more than one policy I wanted him to look at. So here's an example of the next one. Turning when a motorcycle is approaching. Any collision between one of our vehicles and a motorcycle is likely to cause serious injury or death to the motorcyclist. Whenever a motorcycle is seen overtaking you from behind or approaching from the front, it's safer to allow the motorcycle to pass rather than guess about whether you have enough time to clear a lane or an intersection.